Welcome everybody here to the Lakers Lounge. I'm Anthony Irwin, not live for this one because we're recording at 8.30 in the morning on a Thursday morning. It would be 6.30 uh, in the morning back home. So nobody would be watching. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and uh, run this one a little bit later in the, uh, in the day slash evening. My guest today is one of my absolute favorite people to talk basketball with. Unfortunately, last year, you know, because you cover the Grizzlies, there just wasn't much reason to talk basketball with you. Um, the, the, he is Keith Parrish. He hosts Fast Break Breakfast and Grits and Grinds. Um, like I said, a, a truly unique voice in all of this. I really enjoy it. Uh, how, how, how are you holding up, man? I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. You didn't want to talk about Majinha Pereira last year? <laughs> See? Wait, wait we should start the show. We should start name. the show, Anthony, with Jordan Goodwin. <laughs> you, yeah, guys have, think... you guys have Jordan Goodwin, right? We do. We do. We just got What him. do you want to know? Your highest rebounder, I believe. Like He led a, the Grizzlies a... in rebounds per game. <laughs> a full <laughs> two more rebounds position? per game than Jaron Jackson Jr. <laughs> Listen, there's a lot of missed shots to go around uh, yeah. on the 2023-2024 Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, Jordan Goodwin, if you don't know, I'll let the listeners know. I'm sure you know. Jordan yeah. Goodwin... Totally. He's got that dog in him, which is fun. Like I like guys like that. Multiple effort guys like player. That. If yeah. that man had any form of of a jumper or scoring ability, <laughs> he would be a locked in NBA player. Unfortunately, right now he he's just going with the I got that dog in me, and that gets yeah. you pretty far. That gets you quite far in the NBA. So I it's, hope he makes your final rusher. It's Jared Vanderbilt's entire deal. Yeah. Uh, this is a better dribbling, uh, much shorter Jared Vanderbilt. <laughs> yeah, I. You know what? That's a. That's exactly the guy that the Lakers need. Not really, but no. You know, like kind of. You know. They, I mean, let's say shades. Shades of Ben Simmons. <laughs> oh, so he doesn't play? He doesn't... I don't want to. No, no. He's no. He's got that dog in him. Sorry, that's okay, very different. Okay. Got that dog in him. <laughs> um. Today's show, like I said, we, we, we not, I haven't said it yet, but uh, as I've said earlier on previous shows, we're, we're doing this contender series. We're doing this trade partner series. We're basically just doing any kind of series that we can to get us to October. And um, I'm, I'm doing this in order of teams that I find most interesting. So I kicked it off with uh, Samus Fondiari uh, to talk about the Warriors who are way too similar to the Lakers. I hope you guys have, have either checked that out or go back and check it out. The next team that I find really interesting is the, is this Memphis Grizzlies team that's looking to have the bounce back season from the season from hell. You know, um, in, in last year, it wasn't particularly scientific, but um, in my prep for last year, I kind of said this feels like, you know, pretty early on in the series too. I felt like it just, Every so often you have these teams have these series or seasons that just they start poorly and then they get worse and then they somehow keep getting worse over the course of the year. But that also leads to a bounce back year. And if the Memphis Grizzlies bounce back, the Lakers could be looking at the outside, you know, be looking um, from the outside, looking in at this play in situation. Um, Keith, like are, are is it too simple to just write them in or pencil them in as like as good as they were two years ago? Like how much has changed from, from that year to, to now to where I can't just, you know, automatically say, well, jaws back, Bane's back, uh, no Dylan Brooks, no Steven Adams, but this, this team still feels like it, it has a, a, a ton of upside to it. Yeah. I think as far as like, can you just pencil them in to like, play in or higher i think absolutely i think honestly yeah. it would be shocking if they didn't finish with i think one of the eight best records in the west i personally think it would be surprising uh, with the the caveats about health you throw out for every team i'd be really surprised if they didn't finish with one of the six best records in the west this upcoming season um the question that you that you were saying about is this team better than the two years ago team um, that is the interesting question. And now if we turn the clock back, this is the year where the Grizzlies lost to your Lakers in the postseason. Um, mm -hmm. the Grizzlies lost in six games. Um, Rui Hachimura had like a 85% true shooting percentage for the series. Out of, out of body experience uh, for Rui. <laughs> that team, of course, did not have Steven Adams and did not have Brandon Clark because they'd been injured right. and lost for the year. If you turn it back to 
that team before those injuries. Well, guess what? That team had the second best net rating in the NBA. I can't yeah. remember the exact record right now because it's September and all my Grizzly stats have slipped from my brain. But yeah. that team was something like 31 and 12 or something. And, and you know, like they, they were they were killing people up until Steven Adams gets injured. And yeah. so and forced Jaron Jackson to play center. Right. With, and so then you went into that Lakers series with no Brandon Clark, no Jaron Jackson Jr. And like, I mean, Tillman had an out of body experience in game two. He was incredible. Uh, yeah, he, he was great. <laughs> but like you're depending on David Roddy to play minutes in that series. And also Dylan Brooks had a complete meltdown. And Tyus Jones was garbage. Also, by the way, yep. John Morant got hurt because of a missed block charge call. Fix your rules, NBA. <laughs> I mean, it, it's bad enough Tough that calls the block against the Lakers. No way, Keith. It's bad enough that you. the block charge rule incentivizes players to injure our high flyers. But when you yeah. make the incorrect call, you give LeBron. Oh, let's call it a charge, and then and then Josh sprains his wrist. Uh, it's okay. I'm not sore. Um, but the Keith, question now look, is: he's Forty years old, Keith. You got to yeah, give like if, if LeBron's going to fall over, you got to reward him. You got to give him something. Um. But now it's like the question is, if that healthy Grizzlies team, which was really, really good, is this team better? And that is a fair question, and I don't, don't know the answer. That answer is, can, can Zach Eady step in on day one, and then Marcus Smart, and then Vince Williams Jr. and Gigi Jackson, who kind of emerged in last year's broken season, yeah. is the addition of Marcus Smart, Zach Eady, Vince Williams Jr., does that fully replace what you lost? with Steven Adams and Dylan Brooks on good behavior. To me, that is kind of a, maybe it's a wash. I think also included in that is Ja Morant, Desmond Bain, and Jaron Jackson Jr. are all two years older. And mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, not the case with your Lakers team where you're like, LeBron James is two years older from that point. That's yeah. bad. I think for the Grizzlies, you're like, all right, well, Ja's now 25. Desmond Bain is now what is he 26 I think Jaron just turned 25 last week or something yeah like they're still yeah. they're in their primes and so I think I think Grizzlies fans think this team is better than last year's two years ago healthy squad I'm more uh agnostic about it because I'm like Steven Adams was really awesome and yeah. whether or not the better offense of ED but probably way worse passing maybe not as good rebounding how is that all going to work I don't know. I think that is up in the air. That being said, as I finish up my long-winded speech, the uh, I think the Grizzlies, yeah, pencil them in. It would be very surprising if they're not. I think one of the better teams in the West. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm there mostly with you. Um, I think people kind of forget because of the way that Dylan Brooks flamed out how important yeah. he was. Yeah. You know, like he was, he was brutal in that series you know it was just you 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 watched this guy uh he wasn't talking to the press he just it was just it was just a complete um crash out as the kids say nowadays and and then uh you know with with those wing defenders especially against the lebron james team if your best wing defender is having a mental breakdown it really <laughs> sets everything um yeah. you know into into disarray uh, you mentioned the jaw injury. I also thought that, um, you know, with the way that Anthony Davis was able to defend in that series, uh, that was the first time I ever saw a jaw look at the rim and be like, oh, man, that guy's there again. Shit. I um, mean, well, I, I I don't want to take anything away from Anthony Davis, who mm -hmm. was maybe the best player in that series. He was, he was unbelievable. It did yeah. seem like the Grizzlies' strategy was like, like, hey, what if we what if we can wear down Anthony Davis by just driving into him every single time? <laughs> and it was like, guys, that's a bad plan. Um, but that being he said, I believe I believe Jai averaged thirty and ten that series. So I mean, oh no, he was still I, incredible. I he, was, he, he had he had a forty three. pointer. What what was that? That overtime? He had like forty five and yeah, yeah. Anyways, yeah. No, I I I more meant um in terms of like his approach to it. Right, he started shooting yeah. more threes, yeah. really focused on the floater and stuff like that. Whereas like yep. when Jaw's really cooking. It, it, like get out of his way on his way to the rim kind of deal. And then um, the Steven Adams thing, like Adams to Edie Adams um, for one thing, the cool factor, you know, which, which is a, a little used metrics metric, but Steven Adams, one of the coolest, I think players in, in the NBA, like legitimately there he is. Steven Adams. Yeah, is that, Steven is that Adams right here? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but he, 
yeah, like the, 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 the physical, like the physicality, that's something that uh, Anthony Davis doesn't particularly love. That's what he keeps telling the Lakers that he doesn't love is like fighting with guys like Steven Adams and the Lakers are like, sorry, um, which number who's, who's calling us. Um, so like the, the physicality aspect of it, do you think Edie can bring some of that? Cause I think that's the part of, of the Steven Adams experience that, um, if you're talking about like the transition from one type of player to another, if, if Edie can be as physical or as difficult to move, he's a giant human being, um, as Steven Adams is, you know, that is that something you could see as being possible? Yeah. I mean, I think you, you bring up what is in my mind, maybe the biggest question about the Grizzlies. And that is just the physicality of the front court and, and how are they going to end possessions with defensive yeah. rebounding? I think this team, like they were for most of the season last year, uh, they were a top 10 defense in the NBA and they've mm -hmm. been a top 10 defense in the previous seasons. And they, so, so we know they can defend on the perimeter. Um, their roster right now, I mean, Marcus Smart, Jaron Jackson Jr., you got deep players of the year there. Plus, you have Vince Williams Jr., who might be the team's best perimeter defender. They can mm -hmm. defend. And Edie stepping in, I mean, he's seven foot five. That doesn't Giant hurt you. Um, as far yeah. as what can he do on the perimeter? Will that be an issue? I don't know. But I think the big question mark and going to your answer about does Zach Edie provide that physicality? That's the question. We hope so. Obviously, in Summer League, in the five quarters he played, no one could move him. But that's summer league, and so who knows? I mean, he played. Yeah. He went up against Walker Kessler. Walker Kessler could not get him to budge. So that yeah. is a legit NBA rotation guy. So the question I think for the Grizzlies is going to be: Can Edie help enough for the Grizzlies rebounding, where they're not in a situation like against the Lakers in the playoffs, where they're just getting destroyed uh, on the glass? And that was an issue anytime Stephen Adams didn't play in previous years was defensive rebounding. And so I, there's a question mark. Jaron at the four, the rebounding's not as big of an issue as when he plays the yep. five, but then beyond him behind those guys, if, if Edie and Jaron start Brandon Clark, I do think is an important key to this Grizzlies team, but he's not like a super plus rebounder. Santi mm -hmm. Aldama, frankly, more of a wing. He just happens yep. to be seven feet tall. So I do think the question for the Grizzlies is, Hey, who's going to body up on other teams and, and, and protect that defensive glass. Yeah, I, I'm really curious about the Zach Eady thing. I, like, he's legitimately, I think, one of the more interesting prospects of the last, I don't know, 10 years or so, because how recently would he have been the number one overall pick without, like, any second thought? You know, yeah. he was, like, the, 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 the best player who happens to play center on a team that um, made the, the, the national championship and... Um, you know, clearly had this crazy physical advantage over the the guys that he was playing against in college, but also probably could maintain that same physical advantage because he didn't get any smaller. The, some of the guys that he's yeah. going to be playing against got bigger, obviously. But but yeah, what did you think? Like the Lakers, I I I was told really liked Edie. They didn't think that they had a chance at at him at seventeen, but they were hoping. Um, against hope that they might what do you think of like the the ed is a prospect deal because the foot speed is a concern but there are so many potential advantages there yeah it's so interesting because i don't i, I don't follow college basketball at all and every year at draft season I, i'm like i've never heard of any of these people um ed <laughs> was different because he was a two-time national I, player I, I, I stayed in college long enough that people like you and me had heard his name by the time he came yeah. out but like for me, as a non-draft person who doesn't study the prospects, it's intriguing that, like, before the draft, everyone's like, no, he's not a top 10 guy. You know, like, maybe yeah. late lottery, you know, maybe the Raptors are looking at him, maybe the Magic, maybe he slips to 17 at the Lakers. Like, that kind of thing was out there. Mm -hmm. And now, after the draft, everyone's like, oh, this could work. And then he played one summer league game, and everyone's like, this is the rookie of the year. <laughs> and and so for me again as an outsider to the draft process i'm like Flying all over the wait, place. It was <laughs> like what was he did you guys all mess up did everyone covering the draft mess up and not have him as like a top 10 guy because what what i see as a, an admitted amateur what <laughs> i saw was like well uh he can score on anybody in the post i think that's yep. gonna work 
unless he's playing like, all right, Bam Adebayo is going to give him trouble. Um, I assume there's some other defenders, but like the guy's huge and he can score and he can screen and he can rebound and just that on its own. You're like, well, that's, that's plug and play. He's, I think he's already maybe as good as like a Jonas Valanciunas with a higher upside. And so mm -hmm. that part of me, I'm like, well, this seems like it's going to, it's going to actually going to work great. And his job is going to be, I think mainly it's mainly screening and rebounding. Um, the fact that he actually has, I think an offensive arsenal as far as post moves. And like, the thing is, you're not going to double team him. So mean. Like he, like he's he, insanely competitive, apparently. Which I guess like, I mean, like really mean. Most like, people I, and I mean are that in a really good way. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the kind, the kind of guy who has no problem. Like he knows what his advantage is. He's bigger yeah. than you, and yeah. he's going to put you in the basket. Like those. Yeah. That's sometimes my problem with Anthony Davis is sometimes he gets a little too nice, and he's like, "Yeah, I could put six, seven Joe Blow into the basket, but also, have you seen my fadeaway? Yeah. You know, it's, and it's, and so now it's like he has that. Now people are like, oh, yeah, he could be like, a, I mean, he, he doesn't have the shooting yet, despite all the players saying he, he's, he's like has a three point shot. But he's like yeah. sort of a, a poor man's Brooke Lopez, maybe a poor man's like Yao Ming. But yeah. My question is, like, if Yao Ming came out now, is he the first pick or is he like fifth? Because he's not a wing and he's not but a creator. Like, yeah. Well, like you were talking about how we were like the the. The, the broad spectrum that we're talking about here on, on Zach Eady takes and the process yeah. and all that stuff. I think what that has everything to do is we're watching yet another evolution of the sport in the NBA where, you know, we're, we're almost exiting the pure small ball mentality where foot speed and spacing and pace was all that mattered. Now we're kind of realizing actually it's a really big advantage to have somebody who's really big and can't be moved. Jokic is obviously like the nth degree example of this. You see it some with Joel Embiid, although it's, he seems pretty easy to move if um, if he feels like falling over. Like it's just I I we're, I, I think what, when when we're looking at or when we're examining Zach Eady's kind of progress and process through the, the draft experience, I, I think it's because we don't know where basketball is kind of heading. We think it's probably getting bigger, and if it is, Eady looks great. Mm -hmm. But if it if it does turn back into, you know, if the if the focus once again becomes small ball is like some guys get healthier or, you know, we get more better guards or whatever, um, then then we'll see how Edie handles that. But at where they drafted him and at the, what the role that they're asking of him, it's a very narrow role, it seems like. Yeah, like I, I think this really has a chance to work out. I, I think the year one Zach Edie again, it's going to be, hey, screen and rebound and that's i think he's going to be really really good at that and then i think there's an avenue where he ends up being actually a, a, a big time offensive advantage and like i was saying like you're not going to double team him he saw a double team every play in college is my understanding yeah. mm -hmm. you, you, like you, you're not going to help off of desmond bain or john ja morant or jaron jackson jr or like or Luke Kennard, like these guys, like I think he's going to have every advantage and it, it could be a great role for him. And like, basically, we just need him to be better than Bismack Biombo. And <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's better than Bismack Biombo. So like, <laughs> it's a great situation. I mean, obviously one of the reasons he's the betting favorite for rookie of the year is the Grizzlies are probably going to be an above 500 team. And it looks like he's probably going to start. And that's not the situation for most of the rookies drafted. Like Reed Shepard's probably coming off the bench and like not going to mm -hmm. play a lot of minutes. It does look like from day one, Edie might average like 12 and 10 and a block and a half or two blocks per game. And if the Grizzlies are, you know, in the playoff mix, that feels like a very comfortable formula for a rookie of the year. Yeah, I, I, I can see it. I can definitely see it. Um, we haven't really talked about the return of John Moran. Well, like, I don't even know where to set my baseline of expectations yeah. for on this. It's yeah. kind of uncharted territory with him on this front. Um, he and Bain are a really fascinating uh, backcourt. You know, uh, Bain looked really good playing without John Moran at, at, at some times, but then there were other times where it's like, he could really use the guy who just absolutely obliterates defenses and then Bain can pick up the pieces. 
and then you add Marcus Smart to it. Like, are they going to go with a three guard front? Like, is that is that the plan? Do you think? Uh, I believe we don't call Marcus Smart a guard. Is the way we work around that in, in these parts? Mm. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I think they are. I, I think I think you're going to start those veterans. Um, going to the return of John Morant. I mean, that of course is the, maybe I said the biggest question is like defensive rebounding. It's actually John Morant. You know, like is he back to where he was? I mean, the guys played nine games over the past year and a half. Yeah. Um, I think if you're going to take the optimistic approach, which I, I don't know why we wouldn't like, he's so he young, he's healthy. He just yeah. Yeah. Well, he, he did. He hurt his shoulder. I mean, that's why he, he it was suspension yeah. played nine games, hurt his shoulder, but he's been that's cleared for contact. He's playing right now. But last year when he played, the Grizzlies were good. He won mm -hmm. Western conference player of the week. The first week he played last season. So it's like yeah. he didn't seem like he missed a beat. He showed up and he's like 26 and nine or whatever. And so I assume he's going to be back to exactly what he was. Yes, the pairing of him and Desmond Bain, it's intriguing. Um, it's been one of the strengths of the team. Last year, Desmond Bain got a ton of reps as the number one. He's mm -hmm. not the best player on a good team. You yeah. know, like that. that's kind of like the Bradley Beal Wizards role he was playing. Not <laughs> ideal, but like he handled it as well as you could. I think the thing we discovered last year was he's actually a better, maybe on ball creator than Marcus smart. I think there was some expectation mm -hmm. when the team traded for Marcus smart, that not only is he going to replace Dylan Brooks by guarding maybe the best wing on the other team. We thought maybe he would replace some of Tyus Jones to be the backup point. As of last season, it actually like Desmond Bain was, was better suited to that. So I think the Grizzlies yep. will like they'll stagger the jaw and Desmond minutes um, a lot in the second quarters and things to have, Bain is a primary ball handler, but that is one of their big advantages. It's Ja and Desmond, and I do expect that they will have Marcus Smart for the time being start at small forward. I know there are plenty of people, myself included, I have heard through the grapevine, there are members of the front office who also feel like maybe Marcus Smart would be better suited for a bench role, just mm -hmm. maybe to plug in Vince Williams Jr. Vince Williams Jr. is a guy I'm just nuts about. Um, he is undersized for a small forward, but he has a massive wingspan and he's a big time plus rebounder. He's also a yeah. very low usage guy. So like that feels like it may be a perfect fit into a starting lineup. But I do think maybe the expectation is that, yeah, if you want to call it three guard, they're going to start. They're, they're just going to play a lot of minutes with John Morant, Desmond Bain and Marcus Smart together. Seems small um, off the top of the head. You know, uh, Smart does play bigger than he is. Um, Ja does offensively, not as much defensively. Bain has, I think, one of the shorter wingspans. Um, that's, why no one, that's why no one drafted him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right, right. I, I'm just like, yeah, I'm just trying to like envision what that looks like defensively. But like, fortunately, you make up for it size wise with Jaron Jackson Jr., who, if he moves to the four, is one of the better, maybe I, I still have AD as like the best help defender, but. He's in that conversation. You know, Jaron Jackson Jr. is. It's like one of the best help defenders anywhere. Clear space, uh, block shots, moves his feet well. So that's going to help with some of the size issue. And then you have maybe, I think, the biggest player in the NBA in Edie. So, yeah. like, it's it's kind of a funny balancing act that you're doing there where where your your backcourt or your perimeter is, is very, very small. But your front court, front court is huge. Um, and then if you do have Vince Williams Jr. to go in there and, and throw that, you wouldn't really be a change up because of the kind of athlete he is. But if you, if you have him to go out there and kind of muck things up defensively and just get after loose balls and stuff, I could, I, I see the identity. Um, what, what do you, what's your expectations then? Like what, what do you, you said it off the top of the show. It would be, it would be shocking if they weren't, you know, at least a, a play in team, if yeah. not an upper round team, what yeah. would be, what would be a disappointing season to you? What would be a, you know, okay kind of season? And then what would be a holy shit kind of season yeah. where, okay, wow. Well, I, um, before I get into that, just speaking to the size, which is a, a legitimate concern on, on their, their wings and their guards, just a reminder that like, They've already have proof of concept that they can have one of the top defenses in the league mm -hmm. with the smaller three. Cause like Dylan Brooks, Dylan Brooks is also a negative wingspan guy. He's not very yeah. tall. And so like they had negative wingspan Desmond Bain. He might be not negative, but like a, sh a shorter one, but like Dylan Brooks is a literal negative wingspan guy. And John Morant 
obviously not known for his defense, but they still posted an amazing defense um, two seasons ago and three seasons ago. So I, I don't, I think Vince and Marcus more than enough to make up for it. Now, as far as the expectations, I do think if you get, here's the injury caveats. Like if you get, if you get 70 games out of John Morant, if you get 70 games out of Jaron Jackson Jr., if you get half a season out of Marcus Smart, I think honestly the floor to that is like a, a 44, 45 win team. And that I think would be mm -hmm. play in, you know, 45 wins or so. I expect more just because like, over the years, when they, when you have Ja, Desmond, and Jaron, you're, you're good. And like maybe another X factor is Brandon Clark, another year removed from that Achilles injury. Historically, when the Grizzlies play those four guys, Ja Morant, Desmond Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr., and, and Brandon Clark, it doesn't matter who the fifth is. They smoke teams. It's something yeah. like every single season, it's like plus 25 net rating with those four, plus 17 net rating. with those. It's like every year. It's a great so, group. Yeah, so if if Brandon can step back up to that role where he he's sort of the four, but he helps out, he just hangs out in the dunker spot. He also is a, a help side rim protector, but he rebounds. He provides that energy, offensive rebounding. Like that is it. That's a very strong roster that, or lineup you can put out there. And then we just look at the Grizzlies overall, just their depth chart. We've talked about Ja Desmond, Marcus Smart. Jaron Jackson Jr. And we're assuming Zach Eady again, penciling him in as like at the very worst, somewhere between Jonas Valanciunas and Bismack Biombo. Like just mm -hmm. those five you feel good about. And then Vince Williams Jr. is a very much a plus player off the bench. You have um, Brandon Clark plus player off the bench. Luke Kennard is solid shooter off the bench. That eight man rotation. I think it honestly stacks up basically, you know, with any team in the West right now. I think the Nuggets take a step back without KCP. I think, you know, the Timberwolves obviously had a great season last year. Um, I think the Grizzlies went healthy. They're pretty close to that. I think they're close to the Mavericks, close to the Suns. Uh, like, I'm not worried necessarily about the Lakers or the Clippers or, you know, like like the, the Kings look pretty be. good. I think regular season-wise, if there aren't catastrophic injuries, I would, I would expect them to actually win more than 45 games. I think like 47, 48 would be more like it. And then like the best case scenario, the best case scenario is Zach Eady is ready out of the box um, to, to already be a mismatch for people. And then you see the stuff that the Grizzlies did in 2023, where, by the way, I believe, I mean, they lost in the first round of the Lakers. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the regular season, kind of they were yeah. second in the West and I believe third overall net rating. And then, so like the year before that, of course, they went 56 games. They were the second seed in the West. So like the... The, the best case scenario is just like, oh, yeah, this is who the Grizzlies are. They finished second yeah. in the West two years in a row, and, and they did it with 21 and 22-year-old guys. Now those guys are 24, 25. It's like, yes, this progression has, has gone along. So that, that would be my best case scenario. Or once again, it's a regular season juggernaut, you know, 52, 53, 54 wins. The questions remain, how much will that translate to the postseason? Does Taylor Jenkins have the coaching acumen? He's like one of the longest tenured coaches in the NBA now. Oh, and wow. it's like, does, does he have the coaching acumen for the postseason? Does uh, does the 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 lineups you tried out there to the players the Grizzlies have, are are they prepared for a slower postseason game? Those those are some, you know, first world problems that hopefully the Grizzlies can deal with uh this this upcoming season. Yeah, I the 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 postseason questions are are tricky, I think, because um, you know, they're being judged off of either A when they were really young or B when they were really broken. You know, so like I I it's hard for me to really hold much against them for a you know postseason record when those those situations were so unique. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I I I I really, you know, I, I also think it'll be nice for the Grizzlies to kind of fly more under the radar having had last season, right? There were such lofty expectations because that young core, you know, vaunted up the, you know, the, 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 the rankings in, in standings so quickly. If people thought that that, you know, process or that, that progress would be linear when it never is, you know, teams take steps forward, take steps back. They take steps sideways and stuff like that. And I actually like that they're kind of going into the season just with like a um not a blank slate but it's they're quiet they're they're entering a season quietly um it, 
underrated key to the season though keeping jaw off of instagram line like yeah, just like, sure. like just like like it's it's and i i i do think like i don't i don't pay too too much attention to to players socials and stuff like that cuz so much of it is is uh at this point very well sculpted but i do get the sense that like a, I think a little too much was made out of the situation, and B, I think you know, um, he recognizes how like the insane opportunity that he was potentially kind of squandering, and I, like, I, 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 it seems to me like he's ready to move forward. Is that the sense that you get there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, obviously, he couldn't stay out of the headlines for various reasons, and then had the issues with the firearms on Instagram. And, yeah. you know, it was a huge controversy, whether or not like too much was made of it. It's like we're sort of splitting hairs. There's the one argument I kept making where it's like this is irresponsible behavior and it's immature behavior. Is that worth a 25 game suspension when you start weighing yeah. it against other things in the world? I don't know. I also think there was a situation with me not having any insider knowledge, but kind of the the, the rumors and the way people were talking around the team. It was like uh, they didn't appeal the suspension. And maybe maybe the team wanted the league to do stuff, you know, like yeah. so maybe maybe there were issues. And of course, they had to suspend his friend from coming to FedEx for like there was stuff. OK, yeah. there was stuff going on. And I do think Ja has matured and learned and it cost him a lot of actual money uh, as far as not making a super max. So, like, yeah. I assume he's matured and all that stuff is well past him and the product on the court. I don't think it's going to be affected by any of that stuff off no. the court. Also, they think it wasn't you know, the last time we saw him. Yeah. He's and the great. addition of Marcus Smart, mature guy in the locker room, the addition of Derek Rose, who's there to the be kind of a, of a guiding Brooks. voice. Like, and also, I mean, the Dylan Brooks stuff is weird, but like, I think, again, when healthy, like you said, under the radar, no one's talking about the Grizzlies. And no. again, I would just like to remind people two years ago when everyone, like, that was a terrible season. It's because they lost in the first round. Two years ago, they had the, the second best defense, the 11th best offense. The year before that, it was top five offense and defense. This year, I assume they're going to be top 10 defense. It would be bizarre if they were not top 10. Because again, I think they finished 12th last year. And that's with people you've never heard of playing the final month of the season. And so like, yeah. I think they're absolutely going to be a top 10 defense. And then the question is the offense. It's going to be, are you, are you 15th? If you're 15th, well, you're going to win 45 games. If you now get back into the top 10 again, well, then we're talking about a team that's probably going to win 50 games in the regular season. Is there an archetype of player you would add to this roster over the course of the year? To, yeah, to Paul really George. Kind of yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, like every team, Anthony, I would love a six foot eight, six foot nine all star wing who can shoot and create his own shot and defend. Mm. Um, there yeah. are realistically, I guess. Um, there are pie in the sky dreams of Gigi Jackson developing into that. Unfortunately, Gigi broke his foot. I mean, Gigi yeah. was the youngest player in the NBA last year and what scored 44 in the final game. Uh, yeah. He had a bunch of 30 point games. He had a huge game, I believe, against the Lakers. He also had some huge games against the Warriors. Had a huge Which game. the Lakers are going to try to Knicks. trade for him. Yeah, so like he's a very promising. He has that Paul George physique. He's huge. Um, he played summer league and really showed actually a motor for rebounding, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. We knew he could score and shoot. So he's the type of guy. But I do think right now there are still questions about the size thing we mentioned. I kind of wish this offseason, instead of prioritizing retaining Luke Kennard, they they kind of, they kind of found a guy who could play the three slash four, you know, mm -hmm. a shooter who can defend and have some size on the wing. It also feels like maybe they're a body short in the front court. Um, they're like, I think legitimately going to be depending on like their two way guy, Jay Huff, you know, to step in and play minutes. And I don't like yeah. any time where you're like, Oh yeah. Um, we're depending on two way players, Scotty Pippen jr. And Jay Huff to play actual minutes. We're like, I don't love Former that. Lakers Lakers legends. The and I don't know why you, you guys let Scotty Pippen jr. Go. Uh, he was on, he, he was on my show grits and grinds last week, pumping up actually how fast Zach Eady is in pickup games. He's like, okay. they said he was slow, but he's like the first guy up and down the court. So there's a little pump up from Scotty Pippen jr. On Zach Eady. But I do think, you know, I don't know who the player is because, again, everyone says, I want a wing with size who can shoot and play defense. You're like, yeah, those are all-stars and they're not available. Um, yeah. I would, my pipe dream was always combining some salaries to bring in a guy like Cam Johnson and just saying, like, listen, we're going to we're gonna go to the luxury tax. Um, Cam, I think, slots nicely where he could play the three, but he, he could yep. also size up to the four. You know, it's a sometimes, even a cheaper, much worse version, just like a, like a Dorian Finney-Smith 
a guy mm -hmm. who on a good team is very useful on a bad team looks horrible sometimes just like he's yeah. like he's like six eight and makes 34 percent of his three pointers that's the stuff I, I dream about at night I'm like oh i'd love to have a <laughs> I'd love to have a six, eight guy who makes 34% of his threes and can actually guard two to three positions, you know? And Same. I think it's, I think it's possible. They trade for a guy like that. Um, it, as far as like a better player, I don't know. You, you, you literally run out of players like who can create his own shot and also defend who's six foot eight. And it's like, Jeremy Grant. I don't know. That guy never plays in Jeremy Grant, but that's yeah, that really guy never plays past March. Well, is yeah, he going to take a role? And then the the salary issue becomes really really tough. The Grizzlies, I mean, maybe a headline Plus, we haven't talked about two first rounders for him on like yeah, one of the contracts. Yeah, um, the, the yeah, so like the cost of acquisition and then the cost of like I don't love that fit. So like the Grizzlies are not going to get Jeremy Grant, but I think yeah. one of the issues the Grizzlies are coming into it's just like they're they seem hyper aware of the luxury tax line. And it's mm -hmm. like, uh, you guys told me ESPN wrote articles two years ago about Robert Para paying whatever it takes, you know, yeah. to make the Grizzlies be a contender. And this year they're like, all right, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to salary dump Zaire. We're going to stretch Mama de Diakite so we can bring back Luke Kennard on a nine and a half million dollar contract. And we're going to carry 14 guys into the regular season. You're like, Sounds like you're very concerned about the luxury tax for yeah. a team who I've just been pumping up as being like, hey, you could you, you could you could potentially, you know, make a run at, at home court advantage. And by the way, um, you might have cheaped out the years we were actually secretly a contender a couple years ago. It's like yeah. now the time to win, in my opinion, is now you have Ja, Desmond and Jaron. You're actually paying Marcus Smart as a fourth guy. The time to win is close faster than people think. Like we should know, know. Windows, windows yeah. in the NBA. Yeah, like like windows in the NBA close a good yeah. year or two sooner than than exactly especially owners think. Yeah, you know exactly. So I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Um, is it worth it to lose like whatever it is right now? I believe the luxury tax distribution payment for each team not in the tax it's something like nineteen million dollars. And so mm -hmm. like, I am sympathetic to Robert yeah. Para being like. Would I rather have Dorian Finney Smith or nineteen million dollars? <laughs> I would I'll take the bag of money. Thank you. <laughs> you know, like like is Dorian Finney Smith yeah. worth two games? You know, <laughs> like is he worth uh, a a five percent greater odds of advancing past the first round? It's easy for me as a podcaster to be like, yeah. I want that I extra say, five yeah. percent chance yeah. of winning. And meanwhile, Robert Perra is like, uh Bally Sports went bankrupt. Um <laughs> Yeah. They're only giving us X amount of dollars this year. You want yeah. me to make $40 million less this year when I combine the luxury tax payments and then the money I'm not getting. And then my lack of TV money, Amazon hasn't swooped in and saved the TV revenue for us smaller markets. No, you can't have Dorian Finney Smith. So <laughs> I get it. <laughs> That's a perfect place to end the show. No, you can't have Dorian. Finney can't have it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, this has been an absolute blast. Uh, again, check out his work, Fast Break Breakfast, Grits and Grinds. Anything else specifically you want to plug before we get you out of here? Uh, yeah, I'm taking over Adrian Wojnarowski's spot at ESPN. So follow oh, me at Woj ESPN. You can just follow that. Eventually, I think he's giving me the, the Twitter account. So just follow that for further oh, updates. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yep. Hey, Keith, thank you very much, man. Have a great rest of your day, and I will uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, Anthony.